Is it possible that anxiety is a good thing if we see it as adaptive? Dr. Chloe Carmichael, a clinical psychologist, explains how new chaotic cultural norms, such as gender blur, speech beliefs, victim bingo, and toxic mom culture, play a key role in why our society is crumbling. Dr. Chloe also reminds us that pills are not always the answer. Chloe, I'm so happy you're here. There are so many things to talk about when it comes to anxiety, depression, um, just the situation that we've put our culture in. And you have given me so much food for thought through your book. And so I look forward to diving into this conversation. Before we get started, just tell me a little bit about your background and how did you come about wanting to write a book about anxiety? Sure. Well, I'm a clinical psychologist, which means I have a PhD in clinical psychology. And my practice in New York City, naturally, had a lot of very driven, type A, you know, very anxious people. And the work I was doing with them was a little bit different than I think what they were getting from a lot of therapists and psychologists, just in the sense that I was looking at ways that I could challenge people and even help to teach them about the healthy function of anxiety, which is to stimulate preparation behaviors. So a lot of people would come to my office and they'd say, how do I get rid of my anxiety? And I would explain to them that that's a little bit like a person saying, I want to get rid of all my body fat, right? Um, We don't want to have too much of it, but there's actually a healthy function for that. And so we don't want to get rid of it. We actually want to learn how to use it effectively. And I think that's just something for whatever reason people weren't hearing a lot about. So um, I eventually was actually asked to write a book um, by St. Martin's Press from Macmillan. And so the book is nine of my favorite techniques for turning your anxiety into kind of a superpower that helps you to use that energy the way Mother Nature intended. I love that you talk about this and you write about this. It's so in line with my core belief. I oftentimes say something like kiss your calluses or some of the things that feel really hard uh, are actually good for us. And I think that's the way that you're looking at anxiety. One of the things that I heard you speak about is how anxiety is actually quite a normal, natural thing. And you talk about adaptive anxiety and how, you know, some people that are high performing have done very well thanks to our anxiety. So tell us a little bit more about that concept. Yeah, absolutely. So when we have a little anxiety, we get a little bit of extra adrenaline, a little bit of extra energy. And in fact, even our vision becomes more narrow. And so that's a little bit of a holdover from our caveman days. You know, when we were under threat, we had to zero in on something. But just like our um, physical vision gets more narrow, even our mental vision gets more narrow. And that can be a blessing or a curse, depending on if we know how to use it. And if we can actually point that very focused view in the right way and use that to lean into what is stressing us out. A lot of people, they hear about anxiety and stress and they say, just breathe it away and think of a beach, right? And sometimes that's a good strategy. But if you are anxious because you have a big meeting coming up, the best thing to do is actually to laser beam focus in on how you can prepare for that meeting and use your anxiety that way to propel you. Can you give me an example of how, let's say, young folks, because I think young folks in particular are in this environment that is so anxiety inducing, and we'll talk a little bit why that is. But What particular example could you give that where leaning into your anxiety or going into this more prepared would be helpful for someone to understand what you mean by that? Sure. So there's actually, I can give you an example of when it's good to lean in and when it's good to pivot away. Mm. So say that you're a young person and you have a big test coming up, right? What you would want to do is you would want to use your anxiety to say, okay, well, maybe I could list out five questions that I think are going to be on this test, or maybe I could use this anxiety to create some flashcards. And whenever I feel nervous about that test, I will pick up my flashcards and go through them, or I will review those questions and, you know, think about my answers. And then once the test is over, if you're still feeling really jazzed and like over nervous, but there's nothing you can do about it productively with with your anxious energy at that point, then you would use a technique from my book called the mental shortlist. With the mental shortlist, what we do is we think of five things in advance, you have to think of them in advance, that you know are going to be better uses of your mental energy 
then ruminating on a dead end topic. And then, I mean, your list can be anything from like birthday and holiday shopping to your weekend plans to thinking about your next, you know, test ahead, whatever it is, but you have to write it down in advance because remember, when we get anxious, our vision narrows. And so the mental shortlist is going to seem really obvious in your calm state of mind. But when you're anxious, it'll be hard to think of those things. Um, and so you go to the mental shortlist once that test is over, but you have that extra mental energy that you want to put to good use. Would you say that the things in the mental shortlist are only things that you feel positive about, or is it possibly hopping onto another sophisticated or maybe challenging project? I actually think a good mental shortlist would have both on it because you want to be able to have something on that list of five things that's going to feel like a good choice no matter what your situation. So, you know, you might have times where you're hungry for feeling productive, and so your mental shortlist would say, ah, I can prepare for my other test. Great, I can point the energy in that direction. Or your mental shortlist might include you know, calling your three best friends because you realize, wow, after that test, I feel like I could use some good nourishing time. Mm -hmm. Your clientele in New York, um, I think, is somewhat similar to me in some ways, and that is based on what you describe. We are addicted to being productive, and that is sometimes a challenge, uh, at least for me, before I go to sleep, right? I'm, all day long, I'm productive, and it's hard for me to stop, and sometimes it's even difficult for me to just switch off and fall asleep. You have developed some tools for people like me who are addicted to being productive. What are those tools? Yeah, well, specifically when it comes to sleep, because you're right, that can be a real challenge when we get addicted to that, you know, dopamine hit that we get when we're productive. And so there's a technique in my book called thought replacement, which is where we have just certain thoughts that we deliberately focus on. And one of those thoughts that can be helpful for someone with racing thoughts at bedtime is the thought, the most productive thing I can do right now is sleep the most productive thing I can do right now is sleep. And to repeat that to yourself, because it can actually reassure you and give you permission that in fact, it, it is a good thing to do. There actually is a productive value. Sleep is one of the foundations of mental health. Another thing I think can be helpful for people at bedtime is actually audiobooks um, because they let you close your eyes. Then it gives your you know mental narrative something that it can wrap itself around, which is why sometimes people want to do social media, watch a show. The problem with those things is that you have to keep your eyes open and you're exposing yourself to all these bright lights. Whereas with an audiobook, and I love eye masks where, um, especially the ones that have a little molded cup so that mm. your eyes can still move for REM sleep. But if you put on an eye mask and listen to an audiobook, even if you are awake, um, your body is still relaxing and unwinding. And of course, also, you know, prayer, devotion, those kinds of things can also really calm people and soothe people when it's time to go to bed. So a lot of your advice is actually kind of age-old traditional ideas. Um, and I think much of what you've been talking about recently is that some of these new things that are impacting our culture are actually creating a lot of anxiety and, and problems. I mean, one of the things I, I read that you wrote recently is that mental health is possibly on the rise because of this issue of freedom of speech and lack of freedom of speech. So tell me, how did you come about that thought? I don't know exactly how I came about the thought, really, but I noticed that free speech was definitely under attack. And I felt so surprised that that free speech was in any way, you know, controversial that, you know, people were concerned about Elon Musk taking over Twitter and, oh my goodness, you know, free speech. And me having lived in Manhattan for almost 20 years at that point, I hadn't even really realized how much I had begun to suppress my own speech because, you know, Manhattan can be a very politically correct place. And for me as well, being in academia and, you know, being in sometimes with media, I had almost unconsciously begun to really curtail my own speech. And somehow hearing the debate named that way got me really thinking about it. And then as I actually moved to Florida in 2020, when they wanted to mask my child, and there was something about being in a, in a place where I could speak and say what I wanted to say and where other people were doing it too, I started to realize, you know, 
this actually feels feels really good. And I started thinking about things like self-awareness. So in psychology, we typically want to push people to put their thoughts and feelings into words. It increases their self-awareness. It increases their problem-solving abilities. There's also social support, which we know in psychology is a protective factor. Now, when people are afraid to speak or say their true feelings, even to their friends, because they're afraid of being canceled, as a psychologist, I think that really degrades social support. There's also all this talk about safe spaces, for example. Now, I actually think that we have a greater sense of safety being in a safe space when we know what people really think and when we feel that we can share, you know, what we really think. Studies have shown also that when we use words, we actually slow down the amygdala. The amygdala is the part of the brain that responds to fight or flight situations. And it can, you know, sometimes even respond with violence if that's what it thinks is necessary. And psychology studies have shown that talking about feelings and putting them into words actually slows down amygdala activity and it helps us to think more rationally. So again, why psychologists are not more behind the free speech movement, which would encourage people to talk things through instead of suppressing them and likely increasing that amygdala activity, it's beyond me. Yeah, I'm surprised too. I was just going to ask you that. Every therapist I've ever met said that the way to feel better about things is to talk it through. Mm -hmm. Yet therapists right now are doing the exact opposite of it. And there seems to be complete groupthink, Mm -hmm. especially with therapists. I would say doctors in general, but I would imagine that the the world that you came from, it's even more the case. Have you experienced any of this groupthink yourself? Oh, all the time, all the time. So, I mean, even my free speech article was actually somewhat controversial. You know, many of my psychologist friends, you know, discouraged me. Another time that I, you know, really bumped against that was I started to feel very strongly about this in 2020 when they wanted to mask, you know, my then three-year-old. And as a psychologist, of course, you know, I'm thinking, okay, well, we're, we're covering up his face. How is that going to affect his speech? How is that going to even affect his self-esteem if he doesn't feel literally? seen and heard, you know, people are not responding to him. And so I wrote this article about my concerns about masking children. And I was surprised again that no psychologists were really speaking out against this. Mm. So I was actually beginning to even doubt myself. I thought, am I just missing something obvious here? So I wrote this article. I sent it to a couple of colleagues and said, can you read this and tell me like, am I missing something here? And I got the most interesting response. They said, no, no, this is all correct. This makes sense, but we really don't think that you should share it. And I said, why? Why? And they said, because it could discourage people from masking their children. And I was like, okay, that's the point. (laughs) I know, I know. And I was also told that it could really hurt my career, which, you know, I'm, I'm sure it could. Um, I, I, I think whenever you, you know, kind of go out on your own, you always risk that. But I think you also have the chance to find your tribe a little bit more, um, so there is that too. But yeah, I mean, you mentioned groupthink and, and I do think that there's a lot of that where, where psychologists just feel like there's one particular way that we're supposed to think. And I think it's particularly dangerous in psychology because the root word of psychology in Greek is psyche, which is for spirit. Mm-hmm. And so when we start putting these extreme, you know, politically correct strictures on, you know, how people can feel or what people can say, and it's all coming, you know, from some psychology lab somewhere. And I've been in those labs. I've seen how the sausage gets made. Um, it's it's not always, in my opinion, truly the best science. Psychology is a soft science. And so when we start looking at it um, like some kind of a dictatorship of what we're allowed to say or think or feel, I think it's very dangerous to our mental health. I'm sure it's dangerous to the mental health, both of the clients, as well as you know, the actual doctor's. And I would also add that for doctors listening to this, you know, I think for, for patients to, to actually trust doctors, we need to know that you're real and that you're not controlled and that you're not part of a group think. And the, the messaging that we are getting from doctors that they can't speak because they are afraid. They know truth, but they can't, you know, they don't want their careers to be destroyed. You know, that is ultimately going to impact these doctors because patients like me will not go to doctors who are actually self-censoring, 
right? I'd much rather go to a doctor like you who's courageous and is willing to put the patients first and willing to put the children first as opposed to the doctors who who know and they really do know that masking a two or three or four-year-old or anybody is so wrong for their developmental skills, but we know that they are too afraid to say it because they care so much about their career. I, I just think it's one of the massive disappointments of our time to see what has happened uh, over the last few years when it comes to, you know, doctors in general. And I, I just applaud you for being courageous. And I know that you've been courageous in other areas, specifically speaking against some of the Me Too slash Title IX issue that has really gotten out of hand and hurt many boys. Um, tell us a little bit, remind me what happened there. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to your point about some of these doctors driving patients away and making them afraid, toxic masculinity with the APA's guidelines on toxic, or I think they called it traditional masculinity, um, I think it's left a lot of men actually not seeking care when they probably need care, you know, mm -hmm. for some issue that they're having because they're afraid of being pathologized just for being a manly man, right? Um, but yeah, there was actually, as you mentioned, there was something that came about as well with the false allegations of sexual misconduct in the Me Too situation, which is another example of groupthink, right? Believe all women? I right. mean, obviously, that's ridiculous. As a psychologist, of course we know that women are fully capable of, of manipulation, of dishonesty. I mean, I don't understand why that would ever be, you know, controversial. And, you know, I've, I've worked with women that have admitted to having made false allegations. I've worked with men that have been, you know, the victims of them. Um, but I was invited to speak and to answer your question about what happened with my own uh, community of colleagues in this area. I was invited to speak by Families Advocating for Campus Equality, uh, which is a nonprofit helping um, young men that have been falsely accused of sexual misconduct. They invited me to speak in Washington, D.C., and they specifically said, please don't publicize this in any way because we're so, you know, we get harassed at all of our conventions. So I told nobody. I did write in to a listserv of psychologists and um, ask if anybody wanted to share any scholarly references about the subject of false allegations of sexual misconduct. And within 24 hours, another member of the listserv wrote in and with a flyer for this event where I was going to speak, I have no idea how he got it. And he said, this is what Dr. Carmichael is really trying to ask us for because she's going to be speaking for this organization. I suggest that none of us, you know, should help her, you know, with this because it's, you know, hateful and all of these things. And um, I, I was shocked. I mean, that, that they couldn't even entertain the idea that there could be young men that could be falsely accused of sexual misconduct. And how could we potentially help those young men that, such a broad stance. And this person was not in any way chastised. Other psychologists actually kind of piled on. Um, and and I, I was shocked. And so I, I then went and I did speak. And part of the engagement included sitting with a small group, about 12 young men that had been falsely accused. And um, they shared with me these really heartbreaking stories about how they tried to go to talk to a therapist about the trauma of being sexually, um, of, of being accused and how it was hard for them to trust women and talk to women and, and how could they move forward in this. And they, they said that repeatedly the therapists would accuse them of having actually been guilty and that the therapists were not helpful to them, that they would essentially re-accuse them, re-traumatize them. And, you know, it made me think like, what if, a victim of sexual abuse went to a therapist and the therapist said, you know what, I think you asked for it, right? To me, it's the same thing. When you take a young man who's been falsely accused, right. he's seeking help. And then the therapist says, I think you did it. And all 12 of these men had a similar story. Mm -hmm. And I then went, maybe foolishly, back to the listserv, you know, to ask if, you know, later if, if any therapists would be able to take these referrals because FACE was really, FACE families advocating for campus equality, they were really looking for therapists that could help these young men. Therapists are oftentimes very eager for referrals. A lot of them have great therapy skills, but not the best business skills. Mm -hmm. And they don't, you know, they, they struggle to get clients sometimes. So I put it out there thinking, oh, well, they'll, they'll want to help these clients. Crickets. 
crickets. It's just awful. Yeah, it really is. I mean, these Group boys, think. it's like they're guilty, even when proven innocent. I mean, it, it really ties into the mm-hmm. whole Title IX thing on campuses right now, where these boys are, are suffering. I mean, and, and we, we're not there for them. And I would also say that probably the women are going to suffer from this idea as well of Title IX because it puts it in, it puts it into the young girl's mind that she's a victim all the time, right? If the boy is always going to victimize, then the girl is always a victim. Absolutely. And of course, it hurts the ability of, of girls to, to trust boys and, and to see them as allies. I mean, when you say Title IX, I'm not even sure exactly, you know, which part of that you mean. Like being Title IX, it's a verb now where, you know, girls can accuse boys of, of sexual misconduct and the boy gets expelled from school without any, you know, discussion of that. And then he has to come back and basically get tried, you know, by, by a kangaroo court of a bunch of professors. He doesn't even get to, you know, confront his accuser. And the worst part is that, as you said, the girls are not only seeing themselves as perpetual victims, but they're also learning how to wield that as a weapon. So I've, I've also sat with women that have acknowledged that, you know, they've, um, either have done or have thought about making an allegation against someone and I, they've threatened them as well. And I, I've also talked to men that have been through this where a woman says, it's almost like the reverse. Like instead of a man saying, sleep with me or I won't promote you. It's like the woman is saying, promote me or else I'm going to accuse you of of having Mm. harassed me. So in one sense, the women are seeing themselves as perpetual victims, but they're also weaponizing that, which is obviously not good for them. It's not good for the men either. Our society has developed this taboo to support young men. And it's, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. I can't imagine. So I have a nephew who's in college and he's graduating soon. But I remember I had a conversation with him before he went, went to school. And I said, you know, you, you better be careful. And it's like we're expecting these 18, 19 year olds to be almost like their own attorneys. I was like, if you're communicating with a girl and you're not interested in her, make sure you have it in writing that you say that you're not interested because she can actually accuse you of something. And, you know, it, everybody's walking around in fear, right? They're walking in around in fear of making the wrong move to re- towards a woman or not making the move towards a woman and then she'll, she'll be offended or walking around in fear of saying the wrong thing because the uh, speech police might come after you. And you talk about anxiety. Um, this can't possibly be good anxiety. This is no. really bad anxiety. No, no, yeah. However, what, what it also arouses in addition to anxiety is anger. Um, and, mm-hmm. and just like there's a healthy function to anxiety, which is to stimulate preparation behaviors. And by the way, that was a perfect example that if he has anxiety about being falsely accused, the preparation behaviors that he can take are maybe mm-hmm. to start making sure that he kind of covers himself in that way. But the healthy function of anger is actually to stimulate boundary setting behaviors. So if people are upset and angry about what's happening, say with, you know, some of this Title IX stuff or what's happening in their school board or whatever, the healthy action, the boundary setting action that they can take is to not be silent, is to speak out, is to, you know, get involved, collect some signatures, put that angry energy to its constructive, healthy purpose. We have the Me Too movement on the one side that basically says that women are victims almost at every single turn. And then on the other hand, we have the feminist movement who is saying, well, women are men are basically the exact same thing, right? Then, you know, what is a woman even, right? And so you have these two different opposing statements that neither one of them really makes sense. But how do people reconcile with both of the, with, with the word and the language confusion? Yeah, it is a language confusion. And, you know, I'll never understand how it could be construed as feminism to say, you know, that there's no real difference between men and women and that women are unique 
and that we don't deserve our own spaces and that, you know, it's okay to put a man in, in a, in a locker room mm-hmm. or in a prison, you know, with, I mean, there are situations where you have men who have sexually harmed women and been sent to prison and then they identify as women and they go into a women's prison. And, you know, how on earth would that be feminism? You right. Know? Or they failed miserably at a given sport and then they decided to identify as a woman and suddenly they're the champions. Right, right. And, you know, it's the same community that is, you know, banging the drum about toxic masculinity that's often, you know, trying to push that type of narrative. And I actually think it's strong men that can stand up for women, not that women can't stand up for ourselves, but whenever you have a group that's in some kind of trouble, it's really helpful when the surrounding members can step Mm -hmm. in, right? And so I think that strong men stepping in and saying, oh no, you know, you, you know, men are not going to go in and, you know, be in those women's spaces. It's very helpful. And so, for example, Ron DeSantis in Florida, he recognized Riley Gaines as the fastest female swimmer. And he made a point to say that even though she lost to Leah Thomas, Ron DeSantis said, look, she's the fastest female swimmer and we're very proud of her. And he gave her some kind of a medal. And I can't help but wonder if that connects now in some way to Riley Gaines's courage and empowerment and willingness to speak out, knowing that she has that kind of support and that kind of backing behind her. I can relate to that. I've had many moments like that where I confronted other people in high positions, men, and I basically said to them, I'm 110 pounds and I'm not afraid of the thought police and you are, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I do think that part of the issue is that we've created such a gender blur that even men don't know what they're expected to do anymore. Obviously, Ron DeSantis is an exception, and I think it's why he's so popular, and there are other men like that. But for the most part, our society has been really robbing ourselves of of the true spirit of masculinity. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, how are, how are our men going to fare if we constantly are, attack their masculinity? Right. I mean, even if a man tries to just simply step in and explain something, you know, he mansplaining. Yes. Yes. He can be accused of mansplaining. And, you know, or if a man says, well, I would like to get married and have a wife and kids and, um, I'd like to support my wife and kids. You know, I'd like to give my wife the chance to stay home and take care of, you know, be, be a traditional wife. Um, you know, he, he's accused of, of misogyny. Right. And so we're, we're undermining, I think, women in that department as well, because then the, the women feel as if there's something wrong with them or that, that they have to lash out against a man who wants to provide and protect. And then now we have a generation of men that want to live in their mom's basement and watch porn and play video games because getting out there into the world where they could, you know, just be pathologized just simply for being men. It's a very sad state of affairs for for young men, but I have not lost hope. Um, I, I think that thanks to conversations like what we're having, I like to think that the truth will prevail. I think so. I you know I think that also dads are starting to see how important their role is in our society. I think more women are willing to start admitting that even the dating scene is just abysmal because there is just a complete uh, blur of expectations. Um, and you know, it has hurt women probably just as much as it hurts men, right? Like the, you have this terminology, which I'm trying to make sure that I nail it. Marian, Marianissimo? Marianissimo. Marianissimo. Okay. Marianissimo. Explain Marianissimo versus machismo. Yes. So I think probably most people know what machismo is, which is, you know, just that, you know, super masculine, uh, type of attitude and behavior profile. That's the toxic masculinity concept. Well, it can be. So when, when, when we think of, so there, there would be like macho and then machismo, you know, might right. be kind of like an overblown, okay. you know, a little too much, right? So that's the extreme version of, of toxic masculinity, basically. Right. And then Marianismo would be its counterpart. And again, it's very interesting to me in our society that we want to talk all about toxic masculinity or, you know, problems with men, but we, we never want to look at the female side, right? And in psychology, we call that splitting, where you put one group on a pedestal and it can do no wrong, you know, believe all women. And then the other side, you know, just becomes this totally devalued 
space, which I think is what's happening to men. But Marianismo is actually the toxic femininity. So it would be where you become passive aggressively attached to the victim role and kind of manipulating others or being submissive to the point of martyrdom, you know, that kind of a thing. And it's not good for women, obviously, to be trapped in that kind of a Marianismo role, which is, you know, kind of an extreme caricature of maybe a traditional female that has a bit of a softness and a receptive quality and looks to a man as a, as a leader. Um, when she's taking it to an extreme and she's unable or unwilling to advocate for herself and others, and she seems almost attached to that victim role, mm. that would be the counterpart of machismo, which is marianismo. Marianismo. Do you think that is tied to the victim bingo mentality we're seeing in our society right now? Is it also spilling over? I mean, you see men who are trying to win victim bingo as well. Yeah, well, I mean, because I, I feel like there's no there's nowhere that they can run, you know. So I, I do think a lot of men are kind of emasculating themselves because they've been they've been told, uh, even by the American Psychological Association with their report on you know traditional masculinity, which in my opinion was pathologizing traditional masculine qualities like stoicism or competitiveness, those kinds of things, which actually have a very healthy function in our society, and we, we need men like this, um, but they're being pathologized for that. And, you know, I, ironically, men, men like to, to win female interest, right, in general. And so mm -hmm. if they're being told women don't want that, you know, women, women might like you better if, you know, you kind of emasculate yourself, maybe that men are kind of contorting themselves and twisting themselves around that way. Ironically, and like you said, it doesn't do the women really any good. Um, you know, women actually don't want to be with men that are that are weak and and don't have any direction. I mean, yes, women can absolutely provide for themselves. You know, you and I are, are both very strong, successful women that have great businesses. But yet, typically, women look for men that are going to be, say, taller than they are. Right? Women look for men that are going to. Uh, be able to provide for them, even if the woman can absolutely provide for herself. I say this out of my years of experience in New York City, working with many very successful women. They would always say, but I kind of want him to or like earn more than me, or, you know, I just want him to be taller than me, or, you know, whatever. And I do feel so bad for these men because they can't win. If they, if they go in for that kiss, they can be accused of toxic masculinity. If they ask first, they can be called something else that isn't so favorable either, right? You know, kind of a denigrating term for a weak man. So I, I do feel like men are stuck in the middle right now. Do you think feminism is what led us to this situation of this, you know, gender blur and gender role blur. You know, I has I, it gone too far? The answer is yes, it's gone too far. I, I don't know exactly what led us to it. I do think that there was a time and a place when feminism mattered and was helpful. Like I think it was 1974 that the Equal Credit Act was passed, right? The right. idea that somebody could deny me a mortgage because I'm a woman, right? That's that's crazy. Um, I, I'm all for equality. But at this point now, women are outpacing men when it comes to literacy rates, high school graduation rates, even starting salaries for women just out of college are typically actually significantly higher than those for young men. And yet, everybody is still beating the diversity drum to lift, elevate women, girl power, the future is female, all of this. And again, maybe there was a time and a place for that at one point. But right now, I don't see where it's even really helping women to just have, a you know, illiterate men who are stuck in mom's basement, I, I don't see how that's even really helping women. I mostly hear women complain about the fact that men don't want to grow up. They don't actually want to, you know, take the lead. They don't want to pursue a second, third, fourth date. They don't want to actually propose. They don't want to, you know, take the relationship seriously. If I, I think that if we are really honest about what women are mostly complaining about, 
it's the fact that men are becoming less masculine. Mm -hmm. It's pretty ironic. Mm -hmm. It really is, you know, and it's sad because, you know, one, one of the taboo secrets, you know, that women confess to me sometimes in the office is that they secretly would love to just, you know, be a wife and a mom, mm -hmm. you know, but they're not allowed to put that out there. And that by them not being allowed to put that out there, it not only deprives them, but it deprives men of the chance to feel valuable and desirable for saying, you know, I'll, I'll give you that opportunity. I'll take care of you. That, that, that somehow has become one of the worst things a man could say. It's so true. And it is also such taboo for young women to say, I'm going to choose my family first, mm -hmm. right? I, I try to make a, make it a point to post on social media at least once a month. You know, you can choose family and then have a career. But I think young women right now are made to believe that they have to choose career first. It's kind of like in the culture. It's the, this cultural norm. And then they don't end up getting married until, until way later. And many of them either decide that they don't want to have children anymore, or simply by the time that they decide that they want to have kids, you know, they're already in their late 30s. And that makes it very difficult. Yeah, it's really hard. Um, my other book is actually called Dr. Chloe's Ten Commandments of Dating. Oh, <laughs> because, I need to get that one. <laughs> because I, I do Not feel, that I'm dating, no. <laughs> but I give dating advice. <laughs> yeah. Dating has become such a minefield, you know, for, mm. for women because during their 20s, they're told, oh, you know, you should just focus on your career. Like you said, you know, career first, you know, all these things. And then all of a sudden they find themselves 30 and then they really realize, okay, well, gee, I don't have like a huge amount of time left. But of course, it takes time to date, to find the right person, to be, you know, engaged and all these other things. And as women, they don't want to feel like the pursuer. They don't want to feel like, you know, they're the aggressor. They want a man to pursue them. But then all of a sudden, because society has told them that they should, they've actually waited until a point where they, they, they don't have time on their side anymore. So it's not good for women or for men. One of the things that I think about, because I just think in terms of CEO, right? So I run a company and there are about 120 people that work at PragerU now. And so I realized very quickly that in order to manage humans, we need to have general roles. People need to understand what the expectations are, you know, what is shameful and what is rewarded and, you know, what are the, the expectations? And I think that there could be one extreme where the expectations are so high in society where they, they just can't be met. But we've kind of made it to the other extreme where there are no expectations. There are no clear roles. There isn't an employee handbook. And these employee handbooks are actually very, very helpful because it gives some guidance. I mean, I, I bet you that if you asked a 20-year-old right now if they could use some support in dating and they wish that the person who they're trying to date read the actual same manual, it would be helpful because it's just, it's just a total mess. Nobody knows what they're supposed to do. There is no sense of whether you're doing something right, which I think is also anxiety-inducing. Like, was I supposed to call her yesterday? Was I supposed to open the door for her yesterday? Oh. Actually, maybe she'll think I'm mansplaining because mm -hmm. I opened the door for her mm -hmm. yesterday. Right? And so we just created such chaos over there that, you know, maybe we need to borrow a little bit from the world of management and, you know, manage our society a little bit, mm -hmm. which, you know, I think that's what religion was trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think religion does that. Mm -hmm. And with the rejection of the church and religion, um, I think we've really taken away the opportunity for our society to actually have some clear direction on, on how to manage our, our human relationships. Yes. I mean, so Marissa, you touched on so many important things there, you know, but you, you touched on shame and religion and roles. And I, I think all three of those things, um, they, they go together and, and they're so important. So, you know, shame is, you know, t in today's society, you know, no shame, you know, sh sh re remove all stigma, right? Mm -hmm. As if there are not certain things that should be stigmatized, mm -hmm. right? The healthy function of shame is actually to alert us when we have transgressed our own personal standards, right? Or, or even just basic shared societal standards. 
I do think re- returning a little bit of shame would actually be helpful for people. Um, and in terms of religion, like you mentioned as well, it's a very interesting thing that psychology studies have shown that religiosity, the degree to which someone is religious, can actually be a protective factor when it comes to mental health. And it doesn't even matter what religion, right? Um, it's just the, the the practice of having a spiritual practice and a spiritual community is a protective factor for people mental health. And yet you never see the American Psychological Association, as far as I'm aware, out there saying, you know, June is religious connection month. You know, the opposite. Go, go to your church, go to your synagogue, go to your mosque. You know, in fact, try out different religions, embrace religion. You know, there, there's no such thing. Um, and, you know, to your point as well about roles, we've even gone, you know, beyond simply tinkering with our social roles, which as you explained, I I agree is, you know, damaging and confusing enough for people. But now we're even tinkering with biological realities Mm. of, of, of categories and roles, which I think can be very confusing, especially for young children who don't even grasp the idea of, you know, abstract thinking or object permanence, or they're developing a prototype of, you know, what is a human? What is a man? What is a father? What is a mother? And so for us to start destroying that, I think especially for young children, it can really start to unravel some of the basic secure foundations that we're supposed to build up from. One of the things that religion provides people is meaning and community. And I'd imagine that meaning and community play a very key factor in people's ability to cope with difficult situations. When I spend time with my friends who are dealing with, whether it's work-related stuff or family-related stuff, and they're really struggling, I hear people say, well, how are you taking care of yourself? You know, go take time alone, go on a alone drive, go, go and hike. I'm sure that's a great thing. But religion for centuries has been helping people cope with much of this because they have a support group. They have some people to turn to. They have others that they can actually help. You talk about self-efficacy as a way to actually pull yourself out of, of anxiety. What are your thoughts about that? Yes. Uh, so self-efficacy can absolutely help you to pull yourself out of anxiety. So one of the first things we're supposed to do when we're anxious is to make sure we focus on the areas that we can control. There's an exercise in my book called the zone of control, where we divide things up into what we can control and what we cannot mm-hmm. control. And we're, we feel so much better when we're working on, you know, the areas that we can control. So certainly self-efficacy, which is the opposite of victim culture, by the way, it's the opposite of being told that society is set up in a way that, you know, you're you're powerless and everything's just going to keep you down because you're so oppressed. Um, instead, we're looking at what we call an internal locus of control, which is where you think to yourself, much of what happens in my life, especially thankfully to all of us who are blessed to live in a America, where we actually do have so much freedom of the choices that we make that are going to affect, you know, the the lives that we live and the outcomes that we have. And when you undermine that in people, you create what you what's called an external locus of control. And psychology studies know that people with an internal locus of control fare better in terms of resiliency. So again, that's why I am so surprised that psychologists are not standing up more to challenge some of this you know, victim economy, the oppression Olympics. I think you called it victim bingo. The victim bingo. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think also for women, this, this idea that you'll be happier if you don't have kids, you know, there's the uh, toxic mom culture of like, what a nightmare it is to have children. I'm like, I have the longest days ever and things are really tough, but you know what makes me happy? Serving my family. I mean, being there with my children, being there with my husband. And so this idea that I would be happier if I was alone and I could just go and hike whenever I want and grab a martini because I'm in the mood, that's not really what makes people happy. Being alone and selfish is not what makes people happy, but our culture is pushing this idea. It's not just the culture. I do, I have experienced even with other clinical psychologists, this whole narrative that 
as long as you're focused on yourself, as long as you find time to meditate, as long as you find time to go on your own hikes, you will find happiness within yourself. And now that I'm a little older, my answer is, well, actually, I don't think so. I don't think I can only find happiness within myself. I need to find happiness within myself in order to, to um, live a full life. And obviously, I can't expect others to make me happy. But I also don't think I can be happy totally alone. That's the point I want to make. No. And, you know, there is, of course, an epidemic of loneliness, right? So it's it's insane to me that psychologists will recognize that, yes, there is an epidemic of loneliness. But then, you know, oftentimes, as you said, there, there continues to be this, you know, pressure to just kind of navel gaze or take time for yourself mm. and, and not think about reaching out with your community. I do think it's hard, though, with psychologists because they're in a situation where, say, the example you gave about being a mom, anybody these days runs the risk of being canceled if you were to say to a woman, well, maybe you could take refuge in your children, you know? Um, Can but, you imagine yeah, saying that? Right. Or, you know, saying, well, you know, let's, maybe you should cut back on work and, and, and get back to your family, right? Like that would so oddly be considered a misogynist statement, whereas you know, I think, in fact, it could actually be quite the opposite. But we're not celebrating and recognizing women as wives and mothers. We're reducing to birthing people mm. at this point, you know, and, and really obscuring what that is. Um, or even with abortion, for example, you know, normalizing that to the point whereby um, devaluing a fetus, mm. you're by extension also devaluing the fact of a mother who's carrying, you know, this life inside of her. And so when women are not in a culture that recognizes them as women or, you know, supports some of the special lights that women bring, um, I, I do think it can be hard for women to, to find support in that kind of a society. I wanted to talk to you because you're an expert on how to turn anxiety into a positive thing. And one of the things I can't help but feel is despair sometimes. And when Dennis and I talk about despair, we both know that it's a sin. You know, the Old Testament talks about how feel, the feeling of despair is actually a sin. When when Moses sent the messengers into the land of Canaan uh, to see whether the Israelites can make it into what would later become the land of Israel, the messengers came back with a message of despair, except for, for two of them who were rewarded for that, Joshua and, uh, and Caleb. But God was very pissed off. He was very, very upset with the messengers who had this message of despair. And so we learned from this biblical um, lesson that feeling despair is a sin. And we need to really make sure that we don't harp over that. And I can't help but see a connection between the feeling of despair sometime and anxiety. Absolutely. So when we think of depression, the hallmark of depression is helplessness. And again, remembering that the healthy function of anxiety is to stimulate preparation behaviors. But if you have anxiety and you're in a culture that just, you know, almost celebrates this disorder mm -hmm. um, and instead of encouraging you to become active and to try to solve your problem, because that would be putting pressure and shaming you, right? Mm -hmm. Instead, it almost encourages you to just wallow in this anxiety. And when we then are not uh, searching for those preparation behaviors or because of free speech issues, we can't just have a good heart to heart with a friend and engage in problem solving situations situations, then we almost do become helpless. Mm -hmm. And helplessness, again, is one of the features of depression, which is a, certainly a close cousin to despair. Mm -hmm. So the relationship between anxiety and despair, I, I don't think it's actually that long of a line to connect them. So what advice do you have? Where do we go from here? How do we heal? Well, there's a few things. Um, so one is 
we have to remember about free speech. So with both anxiety and depression and despair and social connection and community, we have to remember that free speech is actually relevant to all of those things. So we definitely want to make sure that we're not staying silent and that we are finding ways and people and places that we can have kindred spirits, right? As, mm-hmm. as Dennis Prager likes to say. Um, and to think again about those healthy functions of those issues. So if you are feeling, you know, anger or, or, or anxiety or even despair to ask that emotion, what is it that I could do? What is the constructive action that I could take? And again, that might be running for school board. It might be supporting someone who's running for school board, or it might be, you know, raising your hand in class and speaking up and saying something that you know is going to be a little bit outside of the orthodoxy of what you're supposed to do. But finding ways to stand up for the truth can actually be very invigorating. Yeah, there, there is healing in being part of the solution. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on medication and anxiety? Well, it's a big one. Yeah. So I I know that like it seems like everybody and their brother is on some kind of medication these days, right? And as a clinical psychologist, I'm certainly not against medication. However, what I think seems to be kind of lost is that we're supposed to go with the least invasive treatment first, right? And so if someone is, say, struggling with anxiety or they're struggling with depression, many times they're pushed into medication almost immediately, Mm -hmm. even though that very same person maybe is spending 15 hours a week on social media which we know can have negative impacts on mental health. Maybe they're not exercising at all, and they're also not socializing regularly at all. And so, you know, to jump to medication with that person, I personally think is, a, is, is, is not in sync with the standard of taking the least invasive treatment. I think, unfortunately, there's a real push to medicalize and monetize so much of, you know, the human experience, right? Because nobody makes any money when someone is told, you know, you could change your brain chemistry by going to the gym. You could change your brain chemistry by being around good friends where you can speak your mind, you know, more often, or you can change your brain chemistry by spending less time on social media. Um, But there's, again, nobody makes any money when people take self-help and and it works for them effectively. And I I think it's really sad, but um, whether it be, you know, big pharma or big academia with their, you know, publish or perish and all of these, you know, diagnoses, I think it's the way that, again, actually decreasing people's personal responsibility and their sense of self-efficacy and their internal locus of control when they are just told, oh, well, you know, you just have a disorder and, you know, you just need this medication. Um, it, it sounds like a quick fix, but I, I think in many cases it can really be disempowering. Now, once again, I just have to say I'm not against medication. Obviously, there's a time and a place for it, but I think a lot of diagnoses are, are overdiagnosed, and I think a lot of medication is overprescribed. As parents, how, how do we know when is the time and place for medication? Because it can be so scary to hear from a counselor that, you know, one's child is struggling and they could do something f- to themselves if they don't go on some sort of medication. Oftentimes it's described by the medical practitioner is a ve- as a very, very low dose, as something that is very, very common. And if the kids don't take it, the situation can escalate. It's scary. It's really scary to be a parent and hear from people who have these degrees that if we don't give them the pill, you know, they could do something to themselves. I'm sure it is really scary for parents. And and I, I really do feel bad for them because they don't they don't have the tools and the knowledge to exercise critical thinking about, you know, some doctor, you know, that that wants to write their kid a prescription, mm-hmm. right? So and again, I, I think that there are times and places when kids do need medication. But I would really want to look at some of the basics first, um, you know, of seeing, well, have I taken my child's phone away, right? Mm-hmm. Because if, if your child has a phone and they're on social media and yet they also need, you know, medication for anxiety or depression, and we know, you know, that screen time, social media, those things, um, 
impact and make someone more vulnerable before going to medication, it might be a good idea, you know, to say go 45 days without the phone. Um, it might be a good idea to say, I'm going to have them in, in a, in an exercise program, you know, again, for, for at least 45 days. Um, or making sure that they socialize regularly. It's another very sad thing is that young people are spending significantly less time socializing in real life uh, because they're spending so much time online. So, I mean, again, it's, it's terrible when I feel like parents can be held almost like emotional hostages, mm -hmm. you know, by someone telling them like, oh, well, you know, your child could really hurt themselves if you don't give them this medication. And again, every situation is unique, and maybe in some cases that's true. But I think we have to also remember that there can be harms of giving somebody a pill when their behavior is actually screaming for a different kind of parental intervention. Maybe they're actually screaming in an unconscious acting out way to have more boundaries, you know, about their phone or, you know, more FaceTime with mom and dad or, you know, just more involvement or more time in nature. All of these things have also been shown to have really important effects on kids' mental health, but I don't see that being prescribed as often. I'd assume that the advice you give is applicable to adults as well, right? Have you done everything you can diet, exercise, sleep, socializing, having meaning in your life before you went on the pill, why aren't the doctors advising this? Well, again, I hate to say it, but I think it comes down in many ways um, to, to money, right? Because a doctor can see you for 15 minutes and write a prescription and make just as much money, if not more, you know, than they might make with, you know, say 45 minutes of talk therapy, right? Or a lot of doctors are maybe afraid of alienating a client, of, of saying, look, you know, I, I think that you even, even talking to anybody about about their weight or going to the gym like even just most regular medical doctors offices if you go in now with like a, a sore knee and you're obese many doctors offices will no longer even tell you bring up to you that you know maybe your weight has something to do with that knee issue because it's considered you know shaming or you know fat phobic to say that to people so you know as to why well, I know, oftentimes I notice that doctors don't really take care of their own bodies it's like have they taken nutrition classes when they're getting you know their degrees it's 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 a whole nother subject but what is hard for me to grapple with is this concept that there is a nefarious agenda when the doctors are prescribing something to their patients. I still want to believe that, you know, many of our doctors, and maybe I, I just live in La La Land. Uh, it is Los Angeles after all. Uh, but, you know, I still want to believe that these doctors that we have a relationship with are not trying to make an extra buck on me. Is it possible that they are feeling pressured to just, you know, give us the candy because we're demanding it and we're their client and the candy is basically whatever that quick fix is. Is that possible? Is it possible that they've been miseducated? All of the above. Um, so yes, whether the candy is a medication or, you know, whether the candy is a validation, you know, where everything that you come in and, and say, the therapist just reflects it back and says, yeah, that's valid, sure, you know, as opposed to saying, you know, well, you know, maybe you could make some lifestyle changes or, you know, those kinds of things. So, yeah, I think in some cases, the, the, practitioner is miseducated. Absolutely. There's just not a lot of emphasis on that, you know, personal responsibility, self-efficacy. Um, I don't see that as much in training programs. Um, again, I think there's also a monetary issue when it comes to prescribing and big pharma and wanting to put a diagnosis around everything. And unfortunately for talk therapists as well, I actually run programs that help to train therapists that want to build their own, you know, success successful practice. And I've heard numerous times from therapists 
that they have kind of secretly, you know, told me because uh, I, I, I teach them business skills about how to build a business. And I also teach, um, you know, therapeutic interventions for how to help people to create change. And I've had therapists say to me, you know, I'm just afraid that if I, you know, give people these tools and then they make these changes, then they won't need to come for their weekly visit anymore. And doesn't that, you know, have a negative impact on, on my business? And, you know, obviously that's very sad and it's very unethical. It's devastating. It is. But it's really unfortunate too, because honestly, I mean, this isn't really the point, but from a business standpoint, I also want them to know that no, in fact, if you help people, they will refer their friends and they will also come back if they hit another bump in life. You know, your, your business will flourish if you're, you know, getting good results for people. Um, but that part really is never discussed in graduate school. Wow. Uh, that's uh, that was what I was going to ask you. In graduate school, was there any sort of incentive for the therapist, or was there any sort of lessons that taught therapists how to push back against the client demanding pills? Because I could see how that would happen. I could see a scenario where you're going to have clients who are saying, "Give me those pills." I've been in that situation with my kids where I was like, no, I need the antibiotics for my children. I need it. They have a cold. I want the antibiotics. And the doctor would say, well, I'm not quite sure they need antibiotics, you know, whether it's bacteria or a virus. I'm like, no, I need the antibiotics, right? And I, I looking back, I actually really appreciate the pediatricians who said to me, you know, Marissa, I understand it's really hard that your child is sick, but you really do not need to give them a prescription right now. But I, I could see how doctors would go through this situation. And I'm wondering for therapists, if they've been given the tools to push back a little bit against the clients and not necessarily start prescribing things every time they ask for something. Is that something that's part of the training? Well, so for me as a clinical psychologist, I'm not a prescriber. Typically, that would be a psychiatrist, right. although in many states, clinical psychologists can also take a few extra classes and prescribe. I never was personally interested in doing that, um, though I, I you know, certainly have worked closely with many psychiatrists about medication. Um, but so to answer your question, no, I don't. I, there wasn't a lot of emphasis on that in graduate school, nor was there a lot of emphasis on pushing back against clients that want to just come for their weekly validation appointment mm. either. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on, you know, learning to explore themes and, you know, just kind of meander. Yeah, just to to meander and, you know, maybe increase the person's, you know, self-knowledge on some level. Mm. But as far as really learning how to how to challenge someone and let them know, um, I'm gonna kind of take the tough love approach here. Mm. No, that there there was wasn't a lot of training in that. Wow, I, th I think the reason I happen to have a little bit more of that background is because I was a yoga teacher before mm -hmm. I was a psychologist. So, you know, learning to help people to push their, their physical limits and realize that they could get stronger that way was, you know, the background I was bringing. Mm -hmm. Speaking of things that are not in your best interest to necessarily promote, do you believe in any of these, you know, apps or technologies that uh, purport to help people with their anxiety or their ability to stay calm or sleep. I think there's there's an app called Calm. There's another app called, is it Rooted, I think, that came out. What are your thoughts on those? Well, I mean, I, I'm a big believer that there's not any one size fits all situation. And so, you know, for some people, um, an app that goes through meditation exercises or, you know, calming down stuff can be absolutely great and absolutely helpful for them. Um, you know, similarly, there's like better help and talk space, mm -hmm. you know, some of these like text, text to therapist type of things. And I'm actually very open to that. Um, I don't think it replaces a traditional uh, therapist. And um, I, I know from my business knowledge of the field that a lot of uh, therapists join those apps because mm -hmm. they're struggling to get or keep clients in their actual practice. Um, so I think sometimes you have to ask yourself about the quality and I really do feel bad for the public. I really do because I'm a consumer of therapy myself. Like I've, I've seen many therapists throughout my life. I'm a, I'm a big believer in it, but I've, and I know that I've gone to certain therapists and, um, there's a story in my book about this as well, where 
they've said or done things that I immediately recognize as, as just wrong, as unprofessional, as not making sense. And because of my own background, I can, I can push back mm-hmm. or just jump ship and see somebody else. Yeah. But I feel really bad for the general public because the therapist might be saying something to them that doesn't make sense. And that person doesn't know, okay, well, do I just need to get out of my comfort zone and trust the process? Or is this person really leading me down the wrong path? Mm. And my, my heart does go out to the public because I, yeah. I think it's hard for them to know. Yeah, it is hard. What are you hoping people get out of your book? Well, the number one thing, if they remember nothing else, is to know that the healthy function of anxiety is to stimulate preparation behaviors. It's it's not the enemy. People often get anxiety about anxiety, which is a total waste of energy. Um, and so when they have that anxiety, the first thing they should do is really, you know, first of all, just ask the anxiety, what's this about? What's the constructive action that I could possibly take here? That's usually a good, helpful starting point. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. I love how open and honest you are. I really appreciate it. We need more doctors like you. Thank you. Good to be with you, Marissa. 